All right, hello everybody, and welcome to Fat Dad Fishing Channel's uh, live stream. Tonight is a really cool one for me. Um, Going to be talking with Adam Helm, who is a guy that uh, I met never in person, uh, but but through Facebook, uh, through Facebook group uh, Kayak Fishing for Beginners, which is a group that I was. Uh, I don't consider myself a beginner, but I was checking it out, and man, what a great resource that that's out there on social media and. One of the things that is always a big concern to me and I, th and I know is a really big concern for Adam is the safety uh, aspect of kayak fishing. And, uh, you know, he's, he preaches it, he harps on it, and he holds the line on conversation and depiction of kayak fishing. Uh, either it's safe or it doesn't go in the group. And that's something I really respect uh, from, from Adam and, uh, he agreed to come on tonight and we're going to go into everything that we need to talk about, everything you need to know about kayak fishing and safety. So with that, let me bring in Adam here. Adam, welcome to the stream. Thanks for having me. That's yeah, good to see you. So, um, you know, I think one thing to, to start off with is, uh, you know, this is a little bit different than a lot of the streams that I do, which are mostly focused specifically on fishing, how to fish, how to find fish, uh, tactics, you know, everything from reading tides to finding flounder and so on and so forth. And for the most part, uh, while you do have your flatfish where you are, we focus mainly on the, uh, the East coast of the United States, maybe the Gulf, uh, the Gulf coast as well, but, but you're not, you're not from our area. So why don't you tell everyone uh, where you're from uh, a little bit about your background and then we'll jump right into it. All right. Um, my name is Adam. I'm down here in Monterey, California. Um, I've been here for about 15 years, uh, originally from Central Valley and from the foothills. Um, spent most of my life trout fishing, strip rivers, lakes, streams, um, ever since I was a little kid. Uh, moved here 15 years ago, fell in love with the ocean, went to Cal State Monterey for environmental sciences, technology and policy and a psychology degree. Um, never left, started a kayaking job um, after I worked for a dive master, as a dive master for a couple of years and commercial diver. Um, and never left this job. So I've been here at Monterey Bay Kayaks down here in Monterey for about 10 years. Um, I've been a kayak fishing guide for nine years. I've um, been a kayak instructor for nine years. Um, I teach all of my guides and train them how to become fishing guides. Um, I also work for um, NOAA um, as a Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary Advisory Council member um, for the recreational fishing seat um, alternate. Um, you know, I'm, I'm out here almost every day. I'm, I'm at work right now. I'm looking out at the ocean at some kayakers, um, kayaking and kayak fishing is pretty much my life. That's awesome. So, so for anyone that was wondering who is Adam Helm, well, now we know, uh, incredibly qualified, uh, the kind of guy that you want in fishing and in the fishing industry, um, man, working with no, I didn't, I didn't realize that, but, but your background as a diver, I think, um, might be one of the big reasons why you harp so strongly on on safety, uh, especially within your group, which is which is appropriate, being it's kayak fishing for beginners. So why don't you talk a little bit about that, how you got that started, uh, and what your overall vision for that group is? Yeah, so during the beginning of the pandemic um, here at Monterey Kayaks, we shut down just like the whole country shut down for about two months. Um, for many people, it's a scary time. For me, I got to fish every day, all day, seven days a week. It was kind of great for that aspect, um, but I had a lot of free time on my hands. So, you know, I was listening to a lot of radios. Um, you know, I'm always listening into Coast Guard and stuff like that. And there was a lot of rescues going on. Um, and a lot of what the rescues were, were people ill-prepared, um, doing things they shouldn't be doing, not understanding how to read weather, um, putting themselves in some pretty dangerous situations. Um, and I thought it'd be a good way to start a platform um, since there already wasn't one i was actually surprised there wasn't one on just a safe place for beginners to ask questions and to be have more of a serious place for for that place for people to feel comfortable to ask those questions and get them answered by people that are not only in the business but um influencers and and experts like you know you rich that you know you've been in the you know fishing industry for a while too so you know it, it's good to have places where people could ask questions um, sometimes it seems redundant with a lot of the same questions, but you know, it's, it's better to be comfortable and knowing the answers instead of getting kind of booed out of other groups or, 
treated like you're stupid in other groups. Um, I just really wanted that free platform for people to feel comfortable to talk about all the questions that they need answered. Yeah, you, you definitely get that. I mean, social media, um, it's it's a disaster. And in, in, I would say most of the uh, the groups that are out there, um, you know, I won't name any. And, and, and for full disclosure, I'm still a member. Uh, I just don't interact. You yeah, know, I, I just I'll, I'll read. Um, but, you know, I'm not really going to say much because it's it's all it's all about uh, bravado and putting people down. And, um, you know, a lot of people are afraid to ask questions. Um, God help you if you ask where to go. You know, I'm heading to this spot. Where can I go? Um, but, uh, you know, one thing that you do find and I will say kayak fishing for beginners, 21,000 people strong already, which is amazing. Um, and, and it is, it is kept clean. So it is kept, uh, interactive, supportive. Um, and you know, I can say as a, uh, it, it, I can say as one of the moderators, one of the several moderators, um, it can be a battle sometimes. <laughs> um, but overall, uh, it's nice because, uh, the general culture of that group is very supportive. Um, and, and, and let's kind of roll from there. Um, well, before we do that, Anybody who, who is interested in kayak fishing, I'm going to recommend that you take a look at that group, uh, join that on Facebook. And I say that as somebody who would be considered a an experienced kayak fisherman, uh, well over 20 years doing it myself. Uh, while I'm not a professional, um, I am certainly somebody that has been on the water in different kayaks, different conditions, done a lot of research on it, and uh, have seen a lot of things. Um, and I, I actually joined it because I found the information valuable. You know, so so even as somebody with with over twenty years on the water in a kayak, uh, I, I would recommend that people check it out. So kayak fishing for beginners. Now, one thing that I think is really cool though is I, I appreciate all the the safety, um, but my my focus is always how to help people get better at catching fish while they're on the kayak, right? And uh, I'm going to put this up here for people to see. I'll just take a second here, but um, and I think this is one thing that that I really liked about uh about you when when i was kind of looking into what's this group about and uh you know what's it going to look like who's this person that's leading it and let me just throw in here some pictures as we talk a little bit more so people can see adam is a legit kayak fisherman uh, i mean those those i wish those were flounder so halibut i'm guessing <laughs> And, and some nice ones uh, in there. So as we as we kind of roll into some of the questions, I just wanted people to see, you know, some of the catches and, and what it looks like out on the on the West Coast when you're out fishing, because we do not have, uh, I don't think you have a species in these pictures that we have here. So it's a little bit different view and, and it's pretty interesting, but uh, wanted to put that up there. So, so as we transition into the, the conversation about safety, um, I'm just gonna ask the, the big question, have you ever been in a situation or personally witnessed a situation out on the water that was, you know, if there was no safety equipment or if there was a lack of safety equipment, somebody probably would have died, could have died, or, um, you know, maybe they did. I, I don't know. Have you ever personally experienced anything like that? Um, you know, before I became a fishing guide, um, I, I uh, again, I was a dive master and then I be, I was a kayak guide um, and I still do guide a lot. And I, I train over 40 staff a year just on how to become a kayak guide. Um, and not only through fishing, so just kayaking in general. Yes, I've come across a lot of situations um, of people putting themselves in danger. Um, not only with PFDs, let's see, I mean, um, a lot of people getting in sit inside kayaks. Um, sit inside kayaks are definitely um, their own ball game. Um, you know, I, I teach rolling classes. I teach instruction for, you know, sit inside, but they're not meant for what a lot of people are using them for. Um, if you do capsize in them, they, they do fill up with water. They do have bulkheads. If you know how to use them, um, they're extremely difficult to get back into. If you do capsize and I've came across a lot of capsizes over the years to where that if I didn't show up or either my guides didn't show up, um, it would have been a while for rescue. Um, you know, we, we, we like to think we like to rely on people like the Coast Guard. Um, Coast Guard here, I mean, it takes them 45 minutes to just get out of the harbor. Um, I mean, they have to, you know, there's a lot of protocol they have to go through, warming up engines, going through safety briefings, all that. So I think a lot of people rely too heavily on, you know, someone will come rescue me. 
Um, but yeah, I've had it happen um, even on a fishing tour. I've had a kayak, um, one of my own um, tours, uh, snagged up on something, capsized. Um, when he capsized, the front hatch opened up. And as it was rewrited, it just took in a lot of water. And it was so much water that it just continued to go into the hatch. So I had to have him get on mine and I had to get back into the water. And basically, I always carry a pump. So I was able to pump enough water out um, to safely get it back to shore um, through some surf. But um, yeah, I've, I've not only seen a lot of rescues, I mean, hearing it on the radios constantly of guys falling out of their fishing kayaks um, far offshore watching Coast Guard respond. Um, I've responded to calls. We have a Zodiac here at work where we've had to go out and help some and assist some kayak fishermen where they fell out of their kayak and just simply couldn't get back in. Um, luckily, they had radios. If they didn't have radios, they would have been out there for quite a long time. Um, and over here in our area, water temperature sits around 52 degrees year round. Um, and if it's the wrong type of wind, you're getting pushed further and further offshore. So um, yeah. And you said it was 52 degrees? 52 yeah nice and chilly we got some cold water over here <laughs> yeah uh yeah, we we definitely have it and and i want to talk in a little bit about um you know a bit about the cold weather weather considerations uh you're always uh, on what i would consider the very chilly side if not cold uh if you're going to be around 52 degrees but um you know i it, I asked you if you had, had seen any of those situations that were, that could have been life threatening. Uh, I personally was in one, uh, in February of this year. And for those that aren't aware, I kayak typically anywhere from New York, um, down in North Carolina, but most, most often New Jersey waters. Um, and I was in the Raritan Bay, which is between New York and New Jersey in February. So the water was in the forties. Um, and it was, it was cold and I was out there and wouldn't you know, capsize. I took a following C with the secondary swell from my five o'clock. Uh, and the current was coming, uh, from about 11 o'clock. So it was, you know, I knew it was coming. Uh, I tried to prepare as best I could and I ended up over in the water and, and what was, what was disappointing was, uh, you know, as far as the safety is concerned, I had everything that I felt I needed. So when I went over, it was more annoyance. Um, and you know, it, I wasn't scared. Uh, but there was a boat fishing about 30 to 40 yards away. The three guys all stood up, looked at me, reeled in and took off. So I'm a mile offshore and now I'm alone and I'm alone in uh, a mile offshore, 40 degree water, 45 degree water. And uh, luckily, you know, we'll, I, we'll go through all the things that you can do to get back in and, and so on and so forth. But, you know, I, I fished with a lot of guys where that would have been a very serious situation. Um, and, and they may not have been able to recover from it because they don't have all the, the proper safety gear when they're out on the water. So let's roll into the first one. I know what your answer is going to be. What's the one absolute requirement for anyone that's going to hit the water in a kayak, whether it's one inch deep? up to a thousand feet deep of water. I, I stand by this all the way. PFD is the number one piece of equipment that everyone should be wearing regardless of how deep the water is or how warm the water is. Yeah, and, and we've, we've all seen the stories. And, and I think that's what's amazing to me. Um, you see the stories all the time. Somebody mm -hmm. fell out of it and it was a foot of water and they're dead. Yep. And, and people wonder why, you know, well, it won't happen to me. And, yep. and they wonder, but... Um, you know, there are so many things that can happen. Yeah. And I, I think what, what a lot of people don't understand is, you know, they may be comfortable in the water. I mean, I, my job is the ocean and I'm never comfortable in the ocean. Um, I, I, you know, un, I understand it and I know how it works and I know what I should do in certain situations, but that doesn't make me an expert. Um, you know, I, I'm always learning and the people that think that they've stopped learning are the ones that usually get in a lot of trouble. Um, you know, we're always learning from, from what we see and what we hear. Um, and, you know, with PFDs, I think there's that common misconception is, oh, it's warm water, I can swim. But like you said, there's a lot of different variables. A boat can hit you. Um, I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen on YouTube videos, a lot of boats have been hitting kayaks over the past few years. Um, if you're not paying attention, you're knocked unconscious. Not wearing a life jacket's not gonna do you any good. Or I mean, even in a situation with a rogue wave or a boat wake that hits you, and you have the PFD on the boat, well, it's not really 
going to help you if, if, if it happens so quick that you can't, can't get that in time. Um, you know, also strokes happen. Um, heart attacks happen. Um, seizures happen. Um, and if you fall into the water with that happening and you can't control your body movements, you could drown. Um, and I think, you know, I hate to say it, but it's, it's, it's selfish just not to wear one. Um, especially if you have friends or family that care about you. Um, I mean, it's, it's totally agree. Totally, totally agree. I mean, it's, it's, uh, okay. So you don't come back. Well, who needed you back? Right. Right. It's all because you wouldn't wear what is absolutely, I don't care what anybody says. I don't care if somebody throws something in comments right now about how stupid I am. They're, they're comfortable. Just yep. buy a comfortable one. Don't get a full back one. Get one that's made for kayak fishing. Make, make sure that you wear it all the time. You get so used to it that you don't even notice it's on. And, and beyond that, I mean, I have everything I need on my life vest. Um, yep. If I were to get knocked off my boat, um, I have my, my radio on me. I have scissors on me. I have pliers on me. I have Advil. I have, I have everything on my person. So if I did happen to get away from my kayak, I have everything that I need on me um, at all times. And it's easily accessible. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm right there with you. Uh, so PFDs. So I, I do want to talk about all that gear that you have on you. I also have a lot of gear on me. Um, but let's talk real quick for anyone who's wondering, you know, what specific brands um, of PFD do you recommend for somebody that's just getting into kayak fishing or somebody has one and just it's time to change it up after a few years? You know, I mean, I wouldn't say that there's one that's technically better than the other. I, I stand by NRS. I've, I've always loved NRS. It fits my body type. Um, it doesn't work for everyone. Stolquist is great. Um, you know, there's a lot of great brands out there. The, what's the most important thing is, is it fits you and for you only. Um, everyone has a different body type and PFDs are different all over the board. So if it fits you, it needs to fit snug. It shouldn't be tightened all the way and it shouldn't be loosened all the way. You need play um, on both ends. Um, and, you know, it, like I said, there's, there's not a specific brand as long as they're Coast Guard approved for your area or Type 3 is the most common that you're going to find. Um, type 3s are pretty much everything that we use here. Um, and I kind of have a bad back, so I really like the, the high backs. Um, the high backs definitely give me a lot more support for, you know, my, my type of fishing and what I do. Um, but again, it's different for everyone. It really just start out with just one that fits and then work your way up to that high end $180 PFD that you know that you really like. Right. I, I, uh, I agree a hundred percent. Uh, I wear a Stolquist. Um, however, I've worn the NRS. You're probably talking about a Chinook, mm -hmm. um, for the women it's called a Chinook. Chinook. Um, yeah. yep. So both outstanding. Um, I, I love both of them. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, I believe the reason I got the Stolquist was because I was getting a new one during the pandemic and I, I couldn't get a, a Chinook in time. <laughs> so I, I took a We're chance on Stolquist. <laughs> yeah, they are hard to get. Um, but I got the Stolquist Fisherman and it's great. Um, what, what I find interesting is the, the newer uh, NRS Offshore, uh, Chinook Offshore, which looks yep. interesting to me, different pockets uh, for different gear that you need that you need out there. Now, we do have a question in the chat, which I think is a great question. Um, I have some pretty strong opinions about it. Uh, I know that you do as well, Adam. So let's talk about this. And the question from Kevin uh, is, is an inflatable just as good as a full PFD? Um, in my opinion, no. I mean, I don't allow it on any of my classes. I don't allow it on tours. Um, I mean, just this weekend, just this weekend we've had, um, let's see, over 700 people come through the shop um, to just go kayaking. We don't allow um, inflatables here at the shop at all. Um, right now, they are great um, for certain activities like sailing. Um, but unfortunately, with kayaking, they're just not that reliable. Um, I did do a lot of testing with these. I've had a lot of brands come in and say, hey, try them out. In two occasions, I tried them out and the self-inflate did not work. Um, so if I was knocked unconscious and the self-inflate didn't work, most of them do have a backup valve where you can breathe into them, kind of like a BCD. Um, but if I was knocked out, that really wouldn't have helped me. Um, and I mean, it, even in all my classes, you really want that flotation. It helps you to get you up higher. Um, and a lot of the way those, um, self-inflates where the, where the buoyancy is, isn't really helping much. Um, I mean, it definitely keeps you afloat. Um, right. 
but it, it's just a different type of flotation and it's it's not a hundred percent reliable um yeah and 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 that's the thing you know on a boat i love them on a boat um mm -hmm. But you know, when when you're on a kayak, man, I, I just I just picture me going in the you know, I was you, I'll go back to what you said earlier. A lot of people get hit by boats. I was almost hit by two last year. Mm -hmm. Um, and had I been hit by either, you know, there's a chance that I, you know, if I took one to the face or to the head, I would have been out. And if that thing didn't inflate, if you need if you need to go on mute and answer that, man, you're still at work. Go, go to, right that's ahead. right. I, I just forgot to turn off the phones. I'm doing that right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, so you know, it, it, if if I'd gone in the water and had it inflated, um, I would have then been at the mercy of the person who was so oblivious that they hit a thirteen and a half foot kayak um, on the edge of a channel, um, you know, to to come around and get me out of the water. And I just don't have a lot of faith in that. Um, I have used, um, you know, these were going back a little while uh, out on when I, out on a boat. We we used the self inflating uh, life jackets, and as a joke, we all jumped in with them on. And none of them went off. Yeah. Um, which was, you know, it was supposed to be funny. Uh, it was the end of the season. We we're going to change everything out. Um, but none of them went off. Um, the only one that went off was one that went off by accident uh, in a rainstorm uh, earlier in the season. And we didn't, you know, we didn't replace it on the boat. We probably had like eight or nine. We usually only have three or four people on the boat. But anyway, it, that's, that's pretty scary to me. So mm -hmm. um, I'm going to agree with you. Uh, and a lot of people will hate us for saying it. Uh -huh. You know, they love the inflatables. They are extremely comfortable. They're oh, yeah. barely there, uh, but they are not the same in my opinion. Um, you know, and, and, and I'm going to say one more thing on PFDs uh, before maybe we can move on to the next thing. You said about adjusting them. They have to fit. And I'll tell you the worst thing that can happen. Uh, one of the worst is you go in the water and all of a sudden it rides up. And now your face is behind the zipper. The zipper is right on your nose because you didn't have it on tight enough. And now right. try to get out of the water. It's it's the buoyancy, again, is in the wrong spot. It's all the way up at your shoulders and under your armpits when you really need it to be down further. Right. Um, and good luck getting over the over the rail. Yeah, uh, and even you know, you know, it's pretty common, even with my other fishing guides, ca capsizes are pretty common for beginners, especially when they snag up and swell. Um, when they snag up and swell, Swell lifts up and it just pulls them in because they don't let go of the, the the rod. And getting people back in with ill-fitted things to grab them by their PFD and you're trying to pull them in and it's just riding up over their head doesn't really help. Um, so just make sure it fits. Yeah, I, I was out. Uh, actually, in the chat, there's a guy named Ed uh, right now. Um, I was out with him uh, yesterday and it was getting a little sporty. And you can be sure the first thing I did is check those straps and make sure, you know, make sure it was good, right? We were heading towards an inlet. It was already, you know, wind whipping and, and chop and, of course, holiday boaters. So uh, that was the first thing I did. And you'll be happy with yourself if you ever have to get out and you have a properly adjusted PFD on. All right. So we can leave it at that unless you have anything else you want to add on the PFDs. Oh, that's, that's good. All right, so so let's talk about uh, first of all, what do you strap to it? And you mentioned a radio. I also keep a radio strapped to mine. Um, a lot of people have it just you know mounted uh, right there. Talk a little bit about, about the type of radio that you use. Any features on it that you find to be valuable? And I think you're going to have one that I'm going to disagree with. So let's. Yeah. I'm let's sure talk. you will. Um, no, so um, here at the shop we have 2021 20, ICOMs. We really like the ICOMs. They float. Um, you know, depending on where I'm going, you, you, you might want the GPS function. Um, these ones, we don't have the GPS function because everything's kind of line of sight in our area. Um, so, you know, it floats. We have a tether to it. So that way it's you could also tether it to your PFD. Um, and on that tether, I also have on all 21 of our radios um, a trilobite knife. Um, if you guys are unfamiliar with the trilobite knife, a lot of um, uh, firemen use it. I use it a lot as a dive master. It can cut through absolutely anything. Um, I had to use it a few times on wetsuits, um, for some not so great situations, um, when I was a dive master, um, but it, it, it'll cut through line, rope, braided line, anything. So if you're tangled up in the water, it's at least attached to, you and you could just cut whatever you need. Also have to save a lot of wildlife with it. Um, but you know, it, it, I like it on the person. Um, everyone should be very familiar with it and play around with it. Um, to a certain extent, just remember that marine radios and DHF radios, anyone can hear you on them. 
Um, that's a whole different conversation in its in its own um, of radio yeah. etiquette. But um, you know, I I really like that it needs to float and it should be attached to the PFD. It shouldn't be able to be loose to where if you dropped it, it's gone. Um, it should be attached to your PFD. Yeah. So that and that's that's where we differ a little bit. Um, and maybe it's because I have the luxury of knowing I'm the only one that's ever going to wear my PFD, right? So I have it attached um, with a pretty heavy paracord uh, tether to mm -hmm. it. So it's attached. I do not have one that floats. And the mm -hmm. reason I don't have one that floats is um, it wasn't in any emergency. It was just one of those practicing jumping off and capsizing your kayak and getting back in. Right. Um, and I had a floating one. And boy, did that thing float up and keep hitting me in the face as I was trying to get <laughs> back to the thing. So I decided, you know what? I don't care if it sinks um, because it's tethered right, you know, right up to my right, uh, my right shoulder. So I, that, that's really the only difference. I also don't have GPS, um, and, and this is something that I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I've thought about it, um, but you know, there, there's not a ton of range. Um, you know, there's. The radios don't have a ton of range, right? right? And people need to remember that. It's not like you're on your boat and you've got your right. 12, 15, 20 miles on there. Um, you're, you're talking maybe a three miles, maybe six if you're really lucky, but there's not a lot. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of the offshore guys, and when I say offshore, I mean, they're not paddling to where they can't see land, but um, it's more or less um, uh, mother shipping when you're on a boat. Uh, you know, I've, I've done some mother shipping off offshore a few times where boat takes you pretty far out they drop you off you do your fishing they go out and do those things um it's 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 more of a comfort thing so if something did happen that gps would help if coast guard was near you um it's not going to help you like you said the you know it, it, they have to be near you for it to work um right but i mean just all of our radios like you said same power cord tether and then i just have the simple trial of bite knife attached to it yeah, and and let's talk about the knife really really quickly. Um, yeah. So, I, I definitely agree. You need something for cutting. I, I personally actually have to get a new knife, um, and, and I lost mine last in February actually, and I haven't replaced it with a permanent replacement yet. And, and I lost it on purpose because, um, again, while I I knew I could self rescue, um, I wanted to get out of the water as fast as possible. So I literally was dropping stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so once, once I went over, um, uh, and this is a real big safety concern and, and we can talk maybe about tethers. I got tangled immediately mm -hmm. in braided line with hooks. I was trolling at the time. Um, and actually I was only trolling because it was so sketchy that I couldn't, I felt even if I stopped the way the wind was going and the swell, I would have capsized. So my best shot was to keep going, left the lines in the water and I got tangled in the rods. I got tangled in the braid. I knew the hooks were you know, gonna come at me. So my first thing to do when I went over is always grab the kayak, mm -hmm. right? Don't ever get separated from your kayak, especially if you're offshore. And then I just start, I took the knife out and I just started cutting and I cut every, <laughs> everything away. Um, and I do have some, some another uh, blade that I can use. It, it wasn't my primary. I ended up, I was like, I just gotta get rid of this. So I dropped it that sank to the bottom and then I was able to, to, to go from there. So, um, but that knife is definitely, I mean, it's the most underrated or under talked about piece of safety equipment in my, in, in my opinion. Right. Yeah. And you know, that also goes along the same lines of, we like to call them um, Christmas tree kayakers um, where they have so much gear. Um, they, you know, it, it, it get becomes start, it starts to become a little bit ridiculous. Um, I mean, you could be out there with some guys and the guy with just one pole in his PFD is catching more fish than the guy with five fish finders, five, you know, a little bit of everything. And there's just so much stuff with that being said, like you said, if you do capsize with that much stuff, there is a safety concern there. Um, you know, if, if you're not comfortable in the water and you're, you're worried about it, have everything floats. Um, don't tether anything to the kayak unless you are a hundred percent sure. And you've at least played around with it multiple times that you could control that situation. Um, I think all beginners should start out with floats. Um, I started out with floats. Um, I use tethers now just because you know, I've, I've been in the situations and I, I figured out how to get through them. And it was, it was easy for me, but I was in those situations. Yep. Um, floats are the best way to start out. Um, and 
you know, I only take out what I'm needed with fishing. Some people take out the same stuff every time. If I'm targeting, you know, flatfish, I'm using live bait. Yeah, I'll bring a knife. If I'm not targeting, if I'm not using live bait, I'm not bringing a knife. I'm just having this main thing attached to my um, right. PFD. And I'm, and whatever's not tied down, it floats. So, I mean, you know, you could always get stuff back, but it's not necessarily worth your life. Just like scuba diving and weight belts. I mean, so what if there's some lead and you got to drop some lead? You know, it is what it is. It's not worth your life. Yeah. And, and I, I tell people never go out with, with anything that you're unwilling to lose. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so when I went over and as soon as that braid started to tighten my, so it was tightening around my legs, mm-hmm. right? So now I have uh, multiple wraps of 30 pound, uh, 30 pound braid and that's not the easiest. So to me it was, I don't need these rods. So I just caught them and let them go. I lost two rods. Um, so it, it, you know, not to me and to me i didn't even think twice about it i was like okay two rods gone i, right. I knew i could lose two um right. and the only other thing that i really lost was a camera right. uh, which again I'm, I'm willing to lose the cameras right so uh it sucks after but i would not change in a heartbeat anything that i did uh because i was out of that water uh very quickly as soon as that boat was was gone i was out i had that thing flipped i was back in and as you said everything floats that is really necessary um you know the rods were tethered i I got rid of the tethers and got rid of the braid but you know so that was on purpose um but uh actually no those two rods weren't tethered the other rod was tethered so i didn't lose all the 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 three rods that i had um yeah but you got to be willing to lose stuff and and all i had to do after that was just go around and scoop everything up that i wanted to keep right you know which was really everything i could find um you know, but there was also a safety concern of paddling in circles, trying to pick up, uh, you know, a, a forty dollar tackle box filled with just a few things because right. I don't bring a ton of stuff. It Same. looks like I do because I have a big crate, but I don't have a lot in it. Right. Yeah, I have a big crate too, and honestly, I mean, I could be out for eight hours and I'll use three or four things. Um, yeah. I mean, I mainly just take out a single Plano box with just an array of different mixtures of things, but it fits all in one Plano box. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I started out probably like most people taking out the whole, the whole kit and caboodle. And you, after a while, you realize you're not using really much and you're not tying much out there. You're not doing much. You know, it's just all simple rigs and um, you get comfortable with what you know. Yeah, I was out yesterday with Ed, as I mentioned earlier. He used one bucktail the whole day. One. I used two because I lost one to a fish. <laughs> that was it. So I used two. Um, he used one. And then I think we both used one rig on the second rod when we switched species from, from flounder to, uh, to tog, which you have to switch, you know, there's, right. there's no choice, but uh, I, and that's a, it's a big safety consideration. Pack light, pack what you need. Don't go crazy with it. You don't need three different versions of anchors. Um, if you, well, we can talk about anchors later too, but, uh, go with, go with what you need. Um, and you're going to be better off in the end. So, uh, definitely agree with that. So the, so radios are important. Um, again, you should look up etiquette. If you're not familiar with it, uh, know what channel 16 is, know where to get the NOAA forecast and, uh, emergency updates. All of that can, can really save you when you're on the water, you see weather coming in, check the NOAA, uh, channel talk to other people, see what's coming, see what they can see, check your phone, look and look on weather radar, which you can get right on your phone. Um, but, but on the topic of radios, you know, I've, I've gone out with people who say, no, I just have my phone. It's great. You have a smartphone. Yes. That's great. It's not going to work. Well, I got, I got plenty of range. Yes, you do. Well, I was on a boat last week. I, I could talk to people, you know, eight miles out. That's great. It's not going to work. Because as soon as you're in that water and that touch screen gets water on it, even if it's in a plastic sleeve, you cannot touch that screen. It will not register anything. So I, I think people need to realize that. Um, it's good. I keep mine tethered on me, but it, it is not uh, It is not a safety. It, it, is, it is not a replacement for a radio. No way ever. It's for social media. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's what it's for. <laughs> yep. I, I keep it handy just in case my wife says, are you getting off the water anytime soon to come home? That's, that's pretty much all I do with it uh, yeah. the whole day because once it's wet, you know, you have to dry it and you have to have dry hands um, and well, good luck if you're capsized. 
cold water, once your hands are cold, you're not really using a, a foam too well. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, so let's talk about some other, some other gear that, uh, you know, kayaks, it's all about modding them up. You know, you got your sit on top kayak fishing, uh, you know, old towns, Hobies, wilderness and natives, a thousand different, different brands. And people love to modify them. Um, one of the most popular because I mean, I think it makes it look the coolest is all the lighting setups. And you see a lot of people putting, the navigation lights on sometimes they put them on backwards and have to fix them but they put the red and the green and then they put the white what are your thoughts on that you know it when it comes to lights it's very specific to states um, i know a lot of states have different regulations um, coast guard has different rules um, uh, you know for when i'm out night fishing for squid and stuff like that you know you just want to make sure i have a light on at all times um, what's really really handy um, that i carry at night is a um, Lucy Lantern, they float. Um, they charge by solar. Um, I can attach them pretty much anywhere. They're cheap. They, they like I said, they float. Um, but the most important thing I think is um, the I forgot what they're called, the towers or whatever, like the Yak Attack towers. Three sixty, yeah, yeah, like the all the towers, the visit. especially in areas with swell. I mean, you disappear real quick when you're in a kayak because of how close you are to the water. If there's two foot swell, you disappear for a few seconds at a time. You're at the bigger the swell, the longer you're going to disappear for. So um, that tower is going to make you a little bit more visible. Um, you know, visibility is key. Um, if you're out at night, regardless of where you are, you need to have a light on. Um, when it comes to the red and green lights, again, just know your local regulations. Look them up. Um, just literally type in your area and Google and light regulations on water, and it'll kind of be, you should be able to find something. Um, but as far as navigation lights, you know, I don't use them. The green and red I'm, I'm not going fast enough i'm not going through harbors i'm not having to abide by um, the harbor rules however if i were up in san francisco um, where there is cargo ships and all that stuff on not only do I have the running lights i do have the green and red because i just try to look like a, as much light as possible because those cargo ships don't stop um right so you know it just depends on where you're at know the local laws but i mean no one should ever be out without some type of multiple different types of lights not just one right and, and i think it's a good idea to talk to the coast guard in your area if you're saltwater talk to uh you know game wardens conservation officers if you're not and and ask them there are a lot of areas where it's up to you right um you know so for example a lot of my fishing it is just one 360 white light that's all you need mm -hmm. um and a lot of people then put the red and the and the, the green on now i've talked to uh multiple people in the coast guard and they're on the water they come by and they say hi i talk to uh marine police officers i have yet to actually i, I have found one um the majority of them have all said please do not put the green and red on mm -hmm. that's not the way we want to see you out here we want to see right. one white light then we know the size of your vessel and uh you know so i didn't do it right um the other guy said why not it doesn't hurt and and he's he's right it it, it may not hurt uh, but i i kind of went with them um, now, if I were to go somewhere else, let's say I was fishing New York primarily and I talked to them up there and they said, yeah, please put them on. Yeah. I'm putting them on the next day. You know, yeah. I'm going to I'm going to get them on there. It really shows like, you know, where depending on where you go, things change. Yeah. And and night fishing is interesting, um, you know, and, and it's something that I, I caution people about when they first start off kayak fishing, because it, it is a different game right now. There's less traffic, uh, but there's still traffic. And you have to understand, you know, you can't have your earbuds in, you can't have music on. Your number one safety feature is your ears. Um, you, you need to have your head on a swivel. You need to keep looking around and you need to make sure that you're visible. And if you hear something and you don't know where it is, you better figure it out, right? And, and be ready to signal, be ready to move, uh, be ready to do whatever you need to do. Be careful around bridges. You know, boats will, they, I mean, they're, they're trying to be quiet too. They're most likely fishing. Mm -hmm. uh, and they'll plow right into you, you know, and, and it won't necessarily be their fault. Yep. My number one rule for night fishing is you don't go alone. It's, it's pretty much the number one rule. I don't go alone. Yeah. I mean, it, again, full disclosure, that was my most violated rule. Um, Same here. We've all been there. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I think for the first 20 years of kayak fishing, thousands of trips, and I probably only went with somebody three or four times. Um, but that was also a different time, right? You know, our parents used to drive 
uh, their cars with us on their laps, smoking cigarettes, uh, <laughs> you know, flying down the highway in the too. Back of the truck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're sitting in the back of the pickup and, you know, they're trying to bounce you up in the air. Uh, you know, I think times have changed. I, I won't go. Um, I usually will not go alone anymore. Um, there are some times where I might, uh, if I'm fishing docks, uh, I, I sometimes justify it that way. But, you know, if you're not comfortable uh, and you don't have all your safety gear, don't do it. It's not worth a, a couple of fish to go out there. Uh, th when, and, and the big thing is when things go bad at night, they go bad quick yep. and they go bad harder than they would during the day because you lose that sense of, you know, you lose help because there's nobody around. Um, you lose, you, lo you lose a lot. You lose a sight, um, you know, so just be, be extra careful there. Um, so, yeah, so I guess that covers the lights. Uh, be careful about what you're doing. Make sure you know your local laws. Um, but there's a lot of other gear, right, that we haven't talked about. Um, you know, one I use to get out of Raritan Bay in February. What 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 are some other items that you think are critical um, for safety? So when I'm teaching classes, um, both sit inside and sit on top classes, there's a few pieces that I, you know, not only require for my classes, but I make sure I teach everyone how to use them. One simple bilge pump. I'm not talking electric battery bilge pump, trying to get, you know, 15 gallons out, you know, hand pump. I mean, it's saved me and other people and it's, it's, it's mostly saved other people um, while on the water. Um, I've come across people slowly sinking and that bilge pump had saved them and their kayak. Um, bilge pumps, a very common piece and it floats. Most of them have little, you know, styrofoam stuck to it. I throw it in my crate forget about it. You know, it's not something that you, you, it floats. You don't have to attach it, but you know, it, it's there. Um, that second piece is a tow rope or something that you could make sure that you can tow someone else or someone can tow you. Um, they, they make them in, you know, I think the um, salamander gear makes them throw ropes. Um, there's all sorts yep. of things. The throw you packs. Can, yep. People yep. make their own. I mean, any type of just at least five, six feet of rope makes a big difference out on the water. Yeah, um, if you haven't been towed or you haven't towed somebody else yet, you haven't been out enough yet. It, yeah. It's going to happen. It, yeah. It's almost a guarantee. And sometimes you'll even tow a boat right. for a few feet, right? Yeah. I mean, people need help out there. You know, I believe it's your responsibility to help them. You're on right. the water. It's actually the law. Uh, but if somebody needs help on the water, you should help them. You should do everything you can. And kayakers, especially, things can go wrong quick. Um, you know, a, a lot of stuff yesterday that I could bring up out in the inlet and I law I hit something and my transducer came off and Ed and I weren't sure what it was. All we knew is that my drive was knocking really bad. It was actually a transducer get hitting the prop yep. and I'm in an inlet and he says, do you need me to tow you? I was like, mm, let's not do that yet, but that might be an option. So let's head in now before it gets worse. Um, and you know, I have rope for it. You know, and and Ed had wrote for it too. So um, the worst thing is knowing you could do something, you could tow someone, and now you can't. Now they have to get in the water and you have to drag them, or you have to try to get them on the kayak with you and, and risk capsizing yourself. So right. love the the throw bags. You know, they sell them. Um, yeah, the throw bags are great. What I really use, um, you'll have to look it up. It's called a stirrup. Um, it double uh, my stirrup yep. doubles as a tow rope. A stirrup is basically a looped rope. Um, a stirrup is used to get back into a kayak. If you dislocate your shoulder, if you are unable to get back in because you're a heavy guy, um, I teach stirrup rescues in all of my classes. You could literally make a step and just step right into your kayak. Um, I also pair that with a paddle float that is also in my kayak at all times. Again, if it's not used for me, it's used for someone else. So paddle float fits on the end of the paddle, wraps around it, and you could blow it up with air. So it creates an outrigger. So that outrigger stabilizes your kayak. Um, it's pretty much the only surefire way to get back into a sit and side kayak. Um, and, but it's so much added. If you add that stirrup to it and you stand up on that stirrup on the side that the paddle float is, you have 100% stability. Um, you could walk right up into your kayak if, if, if done correct. Um, yeah. If you have any classes in your area, you should definitely take a stirrup class rescue. Yeah, and I'll, I'll talk real quick about the um, the paddle float. So, again, when I was out in Raritan, I didn't capsize because there were no waves. You know, there was there was really nice swell. There was a decent wind kicked up uh, from a direction it wasn't supposed to. Um, 
And, and when I'm in the water, I, my first thing again, and I'm going to tell everybody this, if you go in the water and you're offshore, grab your kayak. That is your first, first item of business is grab the kayak. So whatever you had in your hand, let it go. Just grab the kayak because if you get separated offshore from your kayak, it's going to be much more difficult for somebody to find you if you can't self-rescue. Right. Uh, but after that, you know, I, I just pulled it back over. You, you need to practice this. People will talk about that in a minute, but turn it back over. And I have tucked in the seat and, and class, I uh, have a clasp on it. I just pulled out the paddle float, inflated it, put it on there. And I'm a big guy. I mean, fat dad fishing. I'm not, I'm not thin. Um, in the swell and everything like that, I was, I was in really quickly, you know, and then the, the worst part was then you have to take it back off the paddle. Um, but that was it. I mean, it's, it's, it's not hard, uh, you know, and add, and I didn't use a stirrup, uh, but add a stirrup to that. It would have been really easy. Mm -hmm. You know, it would have gone from not hard to really easy. So right. I, I would definitely recommend people take a look at that no matter what, because if anything happens and you can't use your arms to their full effect or, you're just not strong enough. You know, you don't necessarily have to be because all you have to do with that is crawl. Yep. If you can crawl on the ground, you can crawl back into your kayak. Mm -hmm. and that's what it does. So let's talk about anchors. Oh, no. <laughs> Tell everybody, when's the last time you anchored? Never. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I know they have their place. I really do understand that. Um, for me, it's... You, I don't like to sit in one place. Fish move. Um, you know, it's it, and the ones that are there try a few times. If they're not biting in a few times, might as well move anyways, try another spot. So anchors to me, unless you're going for catfish, um, mm -hmm. anchors to me are, aren't really helping out much, um, especially in the ocean. Um, right. if you are stuck on the bottom and you are in swell, it will capsize you. Um, I mean, it's simple as that. Um, or a boat weight comes by and you start lifting up and down and you're anchored and you're, not anchored correctly, you're going in the water. Yep. Um, and again, I like to move. Um, if you're worried about moving too fast and you have too fast of a drift, drift shoots are awesome. Um, it's basically a water sock. Um, look those up. There's a lot of different types. Um, a lot of guys in this area use them for drift fishing because um, we do get some stronger winds in our area. Um, but not a fan of anchors. Like I said, they have their place, um, just not for what I do. Um, and like I said, I know guys that use them for catfish because they want to sit and let their bait soak and same with carp fishing and stuff like that. Yep. Um, but in the ocean, I, I don't think they have a place um, on the West Coast over here. Um, what is commonly sometimes used and they are great are kelp clips. Um, you literally clip it to the kelp that's floating next to you. Yeah. Um, and it has a little buoy on it and it won't pull you in and it'll move you around a little bit, but it'll at least keep you to the kelp. Um, a lot of spear fishermen in our area use it because they don't want to anchor to the bottom either. Um, they just anchor to the kelp and they're mostly diving in the kelp. So, um, but, I, I think that's, uh, what I would call a, a brush anchor. Yeah. Um, it's just the, the, it's got the shape like this and it's got the claw on the end. Yep. 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 Um, love those. I think those are, those are good for safety. Um, and, and I use them obviously only inshore where you have something to, to clip off to, but, uh, you clip off to a sod bank to the, the weeds. It only takes one or two shoots and you just put it on there. And if something comes and it's strong enough to capsize you, it's already pulled off. Yeah. So it, and that, and that's the great thing about it. I do carry an anchor. The only time I've ever used it, uh, well, I used it once, um, used it once last year and it was not a good idea. Um, the, the current was ripping and it was okay. If I lean, this is like a six mile an hour kayak now. So it's less stable at this point. I'm stopped, faced into the current. Uh, luckily, I had an anchor trolley, um, and the water was just ripping through. And every little move, the the kayak was pitching. You know, so I, it was okay. I, I had to release that and start pedaling up, so I didn't, you know, pedal into the the current and and get it off of there. And that was that was not good. The only other time I've used it is on a flat in North Carolina and Pamlico Sound. Um, foot and a half of water. Um, the current wasn't anything major. It was just the wind. It was all wind blown. Uh, so I used that and I thought it was, it was fine there, but otherwise I don't even bring it with me. I use a drift sock. I use a drift sock almost all the time. And the brush anchor, I actually only use that if I catch a fish and I'm near and I'm near the edge, I paddle over real quick and clip off. 
so I don't have to redo the whole drift and, and, and pedal right back up to the top. So, yeah, so I, I, don't, I don't like them. I don't, I don't like the, to use them. I have one, um, but I do not bring it with me 95% of the time. So actually I've never brought it with me outside of uh, the one time last year I used it and was not comfortable um, and down in Pamlico sound. So that I brought it out three times in the past two years. So what other things, um, you know, cold weather, you, you got your 50 degree, 50 degree temperatures. I, I'm assuming you're not using dry suits, but maybe using wetsuits. Um, yeah, I, I use wetsuits. I'm, I'm a huge believer of wetsuits. I, you know, I've done a lot of diving up in British Columbia, fishing up north, all that stuff. Um, and you know, wetsuits, I, I dress for immersion. I mean, dry suits are great. I love dry suits. I can't afford them. Um, and I yeah. know the maintenance, um, even when I was diving the maintenance on dry suits and the seals and it's a lot of work. Um, and I prefer just to throw something on and go. Um, and the wetsuits, yes, they're going to be the, a little bit colder option, but they're still going to be warmer than just wearing your board shorts or yep. um, pants. Like, you know, you just always, always dress for immersion. Um, yeah, it may be hot out. So, you know, wetsuits aren't going to overheat. And if you're overheating and it's that hot out, jump in the water. You're in a wetsuit. Cool off. Um, throw some water on you. Um, here we use Farmer John, NRS, Farmer John, Farmer Jane's. Um, they're sleeveless. So if you do get hot, I mean, you could unbuckle it, half mast it. Um, you know, it's, it's popular in our area to wear wetsuits. A lot of guys do, and a lot of guys don't, um, uh, dry suits. Like I said, they're great. Um, I just, for me, I can't afford them. <laughs> they're like, yeah. That's yeah. And that's, that's the biggest, the biggest issue, um, for everybody, you know, yeah. you, you buy the really good ones that are a thousand dollars plus, yeah. you know, you look at a Mustang and you're talking $3,000. And um, I, I, I did overheat. You get really hot in dry suits. <laughs> you, you can. Now yeah. it's a little it's a little different here. Um, you know when the water is in the in the low forties, uh, and the air is in the twenties. Yeah. Right. So um, that's that's typically where you know the worst part of the year is the in between time. Mm -hmm. You know the water is fifty degrees and you don't want to. You know, usually here it's either you have a dry suit or a wetsuit. You don't have both, right. so it's really wetsuit weather. Um, but now you got to start putting on a dry suit. Um, but you know, that, I, that literally saved my life in February. So, so I'll recommend it, but I will say it's not easy to find inexpensive ones. Um, you know, as an example, I think in the description, I put some that are under $600 for people that want to look at them, but, um, keep in mind, they're not dry suits. They're called dry suits. They're semi dry suits. So water will get in. Um, you know, I had, I had water in mine after I got out. Now, the good news is like a wetsuit, that water heats up real quick, right? So my feet weren't freezing by the time I got in, but they were soaked and I had to pour water out of it. You know, not a ton, but my feet were submerged uh, in the dry. Well, the one was submerged in the dry suit. So um, I think it, it's important. But, you know, I went out with a guy uh, who didn't want to wear one and it was in the spring. And, you know, he's a lot younger than me. Tons of energy. He's like, I'll be fine. The water's only five feet. I'm thinking, okay, let's go. And <laughs> boy, did he get soaked and he was, he was so miserable by the end. Um, and it was kind of like a lesson for him. Now with that said, I'm never doing that again because I spent the entire time uh, concerned. It's not like I could tell him you can't go. Um, right. But in the future, I will say, no, I'm not going to meet you. I, I don't want any part of that. Um, and I think that that's probably... You know, he, he has a dry suit now. And I will say, I'm going to give one bit of uh, advice. If you get a dry suit, get one with a relief zipper, whether you're male or female, because the worst thing that can happen is you need to use the bathroom and you have to go back to shore. That's the worst. So it's worth the extra, you know, $50, $80 sometimes right. to get that zipper in there. But, you know, people should look at that. Um, as far as other gear, I, I just threw some things in there. The, the flags, uh, I have a rail blazer, visa, visa something uh, wow. <laughs> on the back of mine. Mm -hmm. um, it has a light on the top. I, I only use it at night, to be honest with you. I don't like the flag during the day. Um, I don't think it makes a big difference as somebody who boated for 40 years. Uh, if somebody's paying attention, they're going to see your kayak. Um, if, if they're not, they're going to hit you regardless of a little orange flag. Um, but with that said, 
I would never tell somebody if you if you want to put it on there, put it on. You know, it's not going to hurt to have it on there. I just don't know how much it helps. What, what's your thought on that? Um, you know, it's situational for me. Um, we get the really big northwest wells coming down from Alaska, so you know, sometimes we're out where, you know, there's times where you don't see your buddy just because the swell's so big. And I'm saying right. 12, 15 foot swells coming through. Um, I mean, I've I've been out salmon fishing out at Mavericks. I don't know if you guys have heard of Mavericks. It's a large surf break that gets up to 60, 70 foot waves. Um, I've been watching them surf while I'm out salmon fishing. Yeah. Um, and that flag has saved me to the point where a boat has come and said, thank God you had the flag on because I couldn't see. Um, yeah. So it, much it, different it, conditions than here. Yeah. yeah. All depends on the conditions. Yeah. We hit a three foot swell here and it got, that's big. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess our surf launches are probably easier for the most part too. Although <laughs> you have some, you have some really nice bays that you can launch out of. Well, we have, you know, I, I've done a lot of like, I've been in the ocean a lot in like New Jersey, Cape May, stuff like that, Seattle, yeah. and stuff like that. And I notice East Coast gets really short period swells and a really yes. short period. Um, we don't except during the summer, but winter, most of our swells are 12 to 20 second long. Um, so they're oh. heavy, heavy swells. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't make it choppy, but it makes it kind of roller coaster. -y. Um, so yeah, surf launching's landing is not so great in the winter, um, but it's one of my favorite classes. It's definitely the most fun class. Yeah, and I, I think people should do that. I, I honestly haven't done a surf launch in my in my new kayak. Uh, I need to do that. Um, you know, I've done it in previous kayaks, but um, you know, that's it's one of the things. It just makes sense if you ever go offshore. Actually, if you ever fish an inlet uh, on the east coast, or you go offshore, you should practice because you never know when you're not going to be able to make it back in that inlet mm -hmm. and you need to get back to shore for safety, whether it's a thunderstorm, whether it's a mechanical failure, whether you just can't beat a current um, and things can go wrong really fast in the surf. Um, and I learned that, well, it was the fun way when I learned, you know, 20 some years ago, half of the goal was to tip over. Uh, but it, it can go wrong quick. And when you have a hundred pound kayak, with a prop sticking out the bottom or fin sticking out the bottom and it's now tumbling onto you because you ditched inshore, um, you can have problems. If you don't, you know, one thing that people don't, I found this and, and I would say it should be common sense, but it maybe it's not. There's a side that you need to get off your kayak when you come in oh, and, and, you know, and people don't do that. So I've seen so many people get out just to get run over by their kayak. Mm -hmm. right because they got out on the wrong side and, and you can plan that you can always say i'm getting off on the left okay that's fine always get off on the left but then you have to change the way you come in and, and right. people don't necessarily consider that so it's great that you do classes mm -hmm. i yeah, haven't seen any classes once around you, here once you catch a wave you're not stopping your 120 pound hobie um, <laughs> no. or old town or anything i mean once it catches you no matter what you do you're not stopping that kayak and it will choose the direction for you um, so like you said, if you want to go on the left all the time, that's not always going to happen. Just always get off on the ocean side and never get off on the side in between you and the kayak. And the exactly. Yeah. You don't ever want it to run up on you. Um, cause it'll, it'll take you down in a second. And once it comes down, it's going over you. And that goes uh, back to what we were talking about earlier of having things strapped down or things, you know, if you get rolled, like you said, in the surf with stuff that's strapped to your kayak, you can drown. I mean, you may yep. only be in a few feet of water, but every time you get a footing, another wave's hitting you and taking you down again. Yep. Um, so it's 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 a whole different ball game in the surf. Yeah, I mean, you just see regular bathers doing that. They were just out there swimming. They don't have anything attached to them, but they get hit by one wave and they can't get up. You know, the undertow pulls out, the wave hits them from the back again, and they're down again and down again. It doesn't take many uh, many hits before you're in trouble, and when you throw the kayak into the mix, it can get dangerous really fast. Mm -hmm. um, other things. You had already mentioned multiple lights, most multiple ways to signal a whistle, which is a requirement, I think, requirement, all yeah. over the country. Yeah, um, and luckily a lot of the new PFDs, the whistle is part of the zipper, so they're they're adding yeah. zip, they're adding whistles in everywhere. Um, I mean, everyone should have a whistle. I mean, that's it's a requirement. Yeah, I, I also have a, an air horn. Um, I use that mainly bridge fishing when somebody you know they're not going to stop and they're going to fly through, which is again illegal. They're going to fly through on plane or, you know, even worse plowing, uh, the wake through there, I'll hit the horn just to scare them and get them to stop thinking maybe there's a cop sitting there. Uh, but that's about it. Otherwise it's, it's the whistle. 
Um, yeah, and and it's important. Keep it where you can reach it. Mm -hmm. Definitely feel the East Coast has a lot more boat traffic than we have on the West Coast. A lot more boat traffic. It, well, you've been here. I mean, Cape May County, I do a ton of fishing there. That's what I consider my home area. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. The jet skiers are the worst. Um, yeah. See, they're not allowed in our area, so we don't get any jet skiers. Uh, all right. So I might be moving to the left coast. I, I might. Um, so real quick, before we wrap this up, I, I want to talk about a couple of things. Um, you know, this is just part of the safety. You know, you talked about this surf launch class. I think that's it's definitely a good idea. I've never taken one. I would like to take one if I could find a good one around here, just because the more you practice something, the better. I talked about how I've practiced self-rescuing, jumping in the water and capsizing my kayak and getting back in. That helped me in real life in February. Um, but but there are also things that other people that a lot of people don't consider, and that's the waves. Um, and, and what that means. And we, I mean, that's an entire, an entire, uh, live stream okay. itself. You know, we can't go into how to read waves and conditions, but, but what are the things that you think people, as they start to look more closely, instead of just looking, what's the strength of the wind and when's high tide, which is typically what most people do before hitting the water. What are the things that you would look for? Um, you know, what I tell a lot of people is, when it comes to wind and swell, go out on the smallest day, record what you went out on. So it's five knots, two foot swell. Okay, then step it up by a foot and by just a little bit of speed each time you wanna test your limits. Um, you'll know what you're comfortable with real quick. Um, I mean, a, a three foot swell, you know, three feet, oh, that's nothing. Three feet swell will destroy a 400 pound man in, in a Hobie PA 120. I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, three foot, is, is, is technically pretty good size, especially depending on the, the length of the swell. So that the period, um, again, it's a whole nother class, but, um, you know, start out small, don't throw yourself in. If right. you don't, then don't do it. Um, you, a lot of us kayak fishermen that have been doing this for a long time, we all started somewhere and we all started out small or we threw ourselves into it and realized real quick, we shouldn't have done it. Yep. Um, yep. hundred percent. Test yourself a little bit at a time. If you've gone out four times and you're asking people on social media, like, hey, wind's 20 knots, swells eight foot, you know, what do you guys think? And the answer's pretty simple to me. Don't go out. Um, you know, right. just if you haven't done it, don't do it. Have you been in a seven foot? Have you been in a six foot? You know, work your way up slowly and try out some bigger conditions. But when I said bigger conditions, you're just doing a little step each time to try out a little stronger conditions or stronger winds. Yeah, and, and the, the big thing there is um, an eight-foot swell is absolutely manageable if there's a long enough period, yep. um, and you don't see that here yep. often at all, right? So a three-foot, and, and what I capsized in was about a three-foot, but the problem was not the swell. Uh, that was not at all. The problem was the period mm -hmm. and how close together these were, and they just happened to be coming at such a period that the front of my kayak was down at the bottom, just just coming into the next wave, right? So just about to bury the nose as the back was getting lifted up by the next one. Right. So a 13 and a half foot kayak, it was not a good situation. I had full left rudder just, and I was still getting pushed sideways. And that's, that's what happened. As soon as the front bit, it stopped, but the back kept going up. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, the pitch is 250 pound me right, yeah, right. <laughs> right over the rail. Water's pretty right powerful. Water. <laughs> yeah. But it wasn't the waves, right? I've been out in much bigger waves. I went out of it. Uh, uh, well, you fish this area. I've seeking an inlet next to Atlantic City in huge rollers. I mean, huge. But they were so far apart, it didn't matter. Um, you know, they, they were probably close to 15 to 18 seconds. They were probably six foot rollers coming through. The bigger boats were having bigger issues than me. Because it was perfect for me. I'm up, right. I'm down, and then I got this space in between, and I'm back up again. Uh, but yeah, I like the uh, the advice: start small, test yourself, um, and understand it's really a lot. A lot of time, the the direction it's coming from, and the period. You're always. I'm going to say this, and maybe it's not 100 percent true, but I'm going to say it is anyway. You're almost always going to have a problem with a with the following with the swell directly at your back. If it's if it's a shorter period, um, almost no kayak is good in that condition. Um, actually, <laughs> almost no boat is good yeah. in that condition either. So, 
it's very easy to bury the nose in submarine or what's technically called pitch polling where the front stops and the back comes over. Uh, so you got to be really careful about that. So if you ever see that when you're looking on wind finder or windy and you see the, the direction of the swell is coming, what's going to be at your back, just be, just be cognizant of that and just be very careful. If that's the case, don't go directly straight in. If you're uncomfortable, go up and then tack back like you're a sailboat and just keep going across it. At least that's what I do. So um, anything else you, you want to share before we wrap it up? We, it's about an hour, so we should probably get it going soon. Yeah. Um, you know, the last thing I want to say is, you know, with fishing, um, you know, there's a lot of machismo in fishing. Um, you add a kayak to it, there's more machismo. Everyone thinks they, they know. Um, you know, I, I've been doing this for a long time. I, I do this every single day, literally. Um, I, you know, I've been surfing almost my whole life, big wave. I've done scuba diving instruction, dive mastering. I've, you know, I've done it all. Um, and I'm always learning. And if I am uncomfortable, I will say I'm not going to do that, regardless of how you want to peer pressure me or whatnot. I mean, if you're uncomfortable, speak up. The ocean and the water is not a place that you want to be uncomfortable in. Um, you know, if, if people want to put themselves in that dangerous situation, let them. Don't don't follow them. Um, if you're uncomfortable, stick to your guns. Don't 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 do it. <laughs> yeah, that, I no truer words. <laughs> I mean, I mean that's when stuff goes bad. You know, especially mm -hmm. you know in a kayak. A lot of it is up to you and your performance. And uh, when you start having doubt, it's one thing to have concern. Right. It's one thing to be a little nervous and a little on edge, like, all right, I can do this. <laughs> but you know, you got a little adrenaline go. But once you start thinking, I shouldn't be doing this, okay, now now you're now you've already determined what the outcome is. Right. right? And I said earlier, I knew I was gonna capsize. And part of the reason I knew I was gonna capsize is because I said to myself, Oh my god, I'm gonna capsize. Yeah. <laughs> and I went, you know, 20 minutes before it happened. But when it happened, I wasn't shocked because I knew I said it was gonna happen. I believed it was going to happen and you know, I didn't make the best decisions on the way in and I ended up going over. So yeah. So, all right. So anybody who has any questions about any of these things, you can feel free to put them in the comments. Um, Adam, thank you so much for jumping in. I think this is great. Uh, you know, and it's not just for beginners, right? No, it's um, for everyone. I mean, that's how I found you. Um, you know, kayak fishing for beginners isn't just a place for beginners. I want you guys to help me out um, by, giving good advice to people. Um, and again, our, our, our page is run by influencers, people that have been doing this for a long time, professionals, guides. Um, you know, we got, we got, we got a great mix of people and, you know, we're always learning. No, none of us will say we know everything. Um, cause we don't. And if someone's saying they know everything, I wouldn't listen to them. Um, because we, you know, we're always learning. Fishing's great. And I will, if I'm going to rich and he wants to take me flounder fishing, I'm going to listen to every word he says, because I don't know the East coast. I don't know that area as well. Um, and I should hope the same if he came here. So, I mean, you have to be open to learning new things. Um, and again, we're always learning. Don't ever think that you have it all locked down because you don't, um, no fisherman does even the best. They will tell yep. you that they're always learning. They're always learning new knots, new techniques, new everything. That's just, that's the most wonderful thing of fishing is that you can never know everything. Right. As soon as you do, you become not a great fisherman yeah. because it, it's going to change. It's going to change. The best guides are always the guys. If you ever ask around, I, I, I talk to a lot of people, right? Um, and there are some big named New Jersey guides. And I've run into so many people are like, you know what? The, you know who called me? It was this person. They saw on Instagram, I was doing this. I'm not going to give any names, right? Of anybody. Uh, but, um, you know, they actually called me and we talked for two hours because he wanted to understand how I was, how I was getting this result and what I was looking for. And they exchanged information. And, and that's why this guy is one of the best guys that you're going to find in New Jersey uh, and in the New Jersey, New York area. Um, and, and that's how it is. I think for every kayak fisherman, a lot of experience, you know, between the two of us and man, I, I hit California. I'm not going out. I mean, I'm not going out alone. Um, I'm, I'm going directly to somebody who knows what they're doing and I will a hundred percent do whatever you tell me when it comes to getting on those halibut and those, uh, ling cod and, and all of those others. California is a big state. 
um, yeah, I mean, you go all the way down to San Diego, all the way up to Humboldt. I mean, you can't do that drive in a single day. And on the East Coast, yeah. you can drive through multiple states in one day, but you can't do that in California. So a lot of people come here thinking, oh, it's warm water, beautiful San Diego. They get to Monterey. <laughs> they don't even put their feet in the water. It's, 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 we have a pretty, pretty long state. Yeah. It's a whole different thing. All right. Well, with that, uh, I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, thank you everybody for, for tuning in. Adam, thank you again. Yeah, uh, exactly. check it out. Kayak fishing for beginners. Are there any other pages you want to, you want to share or do you just want to stick with yeah, that? If any you're in, in the area of in Monterey or California, you know, there's a lot of great guides here. Um, you could reach me in, um, kayak fishing for beginners. Um, I could hook you up with guides from all over California. We have a lot of great guides here. Um, if you're in Monterey, come by, check us out at Monterey Bay kayaks. Um, we're one of the largest out, um, program outfitters in the United States. So, Come check us out. Um, and again, check out the Facebook group. Yep. We'll see you over there, everybody. It's 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 a great group. So thanks again, everybody. With that, we're going to sign off. And we'll catch you in the next one. Later, guys. See you.